now it's time for us to start considering an implementation. So, I added a little bit more to our design, not much. I filled out these methods so that they have arguments and return types. You'll note that these find methods all return options because it's possible that there isn't a customer or an account that matches the query. Uh, we have the ability to add customers to the bank and in fact we'll probably make it so the only way that you can create a customer is to uh, to do it potentially through the bank. Maybe not, we'll see. Uh, also I added the additional connections for everything that utilizes the the other classes so that we can see the connectivity in this. And in fact, a lot of times it's, it's the lines in the UML diagram that do the most for you. As I said uh, previously, many times when you uh, draw these things, you don't even bother listing out all the methods and you definitely don't bother putting all the details of the methods. In fact, one of the key things that I didn't mention about UML diagrams is that UML diagrams are intended to be whiteboard compliant. Okay? They have to be easy to draw. If you have anything that's too hard to draw, uh, that kind of defeats the purpose because a big part of this is the rapid communication of stuff. And so while you might see UML diagrams in formal documentation, where you really see them a lot is up on whiteboards when people are trying to talk about the structure of their code. There's actually one thing I've still left out of this, and that is the ability to run the program. We need a place to put a main, we need an object. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a new box. Now you'll note that I made this rectangle rounded. So UML has another type of diagram called an object diagram. And in object diagrams you use rounded rectangles to represent objects. Generally you don't mix these two types of diagrams. Object diagrams are completely separate from class diagrams, but that's because in most programming languages you can't declare singleton objects the way that you can inside of Scala. And I, I want to point out that to reduce confusion I will generally use the term singleton object for something like what we're about to put here. This will be our bank main. <clears throat> now our bank main has no data in it. So I'm going to get rid of that, and it will just have the main method, which has the signature that we have gotten used to. And I'll have to make that a little bit bigger to hold it. Okay. The reason why Scala, you might mix these two types of diagrams is because we do have these singleton objects, and you should you try not to confuse singleton objects from the objects you get from instantiating a class. And this is one of the challenges in teaching Scala is that it turns out the, the object declaration is really great in that it makes Scala a much more object-oriented language and it kind of unifies things whereas languages like Java and C++ have to have things in them called static. But from a teacher's perspective, it's easy for students to confuse an object declaration with the objects that we use when we call new on a class. So I will generally use the terms singleton object and we'll see later companion object is also a, another term that's used for these singletons, at least for some of them. And in contrast when we instantiate one of our classes I will refer to those as instances or possibly an instance object. And I'll try to, to be careful about that to distinguish the two types of things because in most object oriented languages you don't have the singleton objects. When you talk about objects and most of the time when I am talking about objects I will be talking about the instance objects, the objects that you get from instantiating a class. Okay, so let's go to the code. We want to start implementing our design. Well I'm actually going to put this in a new package once again, you should use packages to organize stuff, and while I do have a package kind of for this entire playlist and this chapter's worth of material, this is a separate example. This is our bank example. So I'm going to create the bank package, and then let's go ahead and let's make classes. We have one class for the bank. It will just make everything that we put inside of our UML diagram. We're going to make another class for the customer we're going to make another class for the account and our last class is the address. 
we also just added to our diagram an object that we called bank main. Okay, so now we have these files here and we can decide how we want to implement these things inside of those files. So I guess, how about we start with the account? Okay, so the account has three fields, a balance, a customer, and an ID. Um, I'm actually perfectly happy making it so that, well, no, we'll go ahead and try and, there is the decision on the account. Should, for example, balance be up in the argument list or should it be declared down inside of here? Whatever it is, it's something that's going to change. I'll go ahead and put it down inside of here. So I'm gonna make it a private var balance is an int that starts off as zero. I don't actually have to say it's an int here because just making it equal to zero will set it to be an int. Then I also have a reference to our customer and I have a reference to our ID which is a string. I actually want these to be members but I don't want them to change so we will go ahead and declare them to be vals. Okay. So that gives us the data that we have for our account. Now we need an accessor for our balance and then we need the ability to do deposits and withdrawals. The accessor for the balance is pretty easy. We're just going to have def balance equals underscore balance. That way outside code can get hold of the balance but it can't directly change that. And there are many reasons why you should not be able to directly get hold of the balance as far as changing purposes on, on a bank account. Uh, there are all types of regulations about how balances can be changed and what you would need to keep track of these things. And that's why we're going to have methods for deposit, which is going to take an amount that we're depositing. And you might note that the deposit, if it doesn't, we should change Yes, deposit and withdraw both return booleans. Now well, you might ask, why do these return booleans? Because we're just gonna make a deposit or do a withdraw. Turns out there are situations where these would fail. So how could these fail? Well, for one thing, what if you tried to pass them a negative argument? What if you tried to withdraw more money than you have in the bank. So we have some requirements on this withdraw method. This withdraw method is only allowed to to work with amounts that are in a certain range. So we can say that if if the amount is less than zero or the amount is greater than underscore balance well, neither of those should be allowed. And so in that case, we're just going to give back false. Else, well, then we can actually subtract the amount from our balance. Balance minus equals amount. And then we give back true to say that we were able to do it. In the case of a deposit, we're actually allowed to deposit any amount of money that we want as long as it's not negative. You can't deposit negative mon uh, money into account. So as long as the amount, is, well, so if the amount is less than zero, then we're gonna give back false. Else is going to be incremented by that amount and we give back true. So the calling code knows whether or not this is happening. The other reason why we want to have these methods protecting things is in a real bank, we would want to log these transactions. So when we add money into the uh, balance, we would need to have something that stores off, it would probably store a record in a database that would be an, an audit record so that people could come back and see all of the transactions. So, We've just implemented our account. We still have four other files that we need to implement and we'll do those in subsequent videos.